My name is Don Yarjo. I'm from the Office of Admissions at Wayne State University School of Medicine. I'd like to welcome you all to this presentation. We will get it started very shortly. We will have a video first, and then we will start introducing all of our speakers for today. A couple of housekeeping notes. Please keep yourself muted throughout this presentation. The Q&A will be open for you to ask questions. And my colleague, Rachel Charno, will be doing her best to answer those questions throughout the um, presentation. If we're not able to get to any of them, they will be sent out at a later date along with the presentation. So please enjoy this video and we will be right back with you. Welcome. Well, I would like to uh, welcome everybody here this afternoon as we have an open house at um, Wayne State University School of Medicine. And we're going to give an overview of uh, the school and who we are and um, hopefully answer all your questions. I'm uh, Dr. Kevin Sprague, the Associate Dean of Admissions and Enrollment Management Services, also a proud alumnus from the class of 1980. I would like to, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Wild Soccer. Uh, dean Soccer became the Dean in May of this year. Previously, he was the Chair of Pathology since 2008. Dr. Soccer is a nationally recognized academic pathologist with a track record of independent and collaborative National Institutes of Health funding and with seminal contributions in the field of genital urinary neoplasia, particularly prosthetic cancer. He participated in numerous clinical trials as an expert pathologist, evaluating morphologic and molecular changes and expression profiling as markers for cancer diagnosis and prognosis. Dr. Sacker is a passionate medical educator who has organized and lectured in numerous institutional, regional, national, and international educational and training seminars with emphasis on the integrated and multidisciplinary aspects of diagnosis and management. Over his three decades as faculty, he has been an active participant in the teaching and mentoring of medical students, residents, and fellows. He has assumed leadership roles in professional and community-based organizations, including NIH sections and task forces, WHO committees and memberships, and also the National Arab American Medical Association and the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services. Dean Stocker. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dean Spray. Uh, I appreciate the, the nice remark and I am uh, honored and uh, pleased uh, to be with the medical school leadership team and with all our uh, potential students. Uh, we welcome you to Wayne State University School of Medicine. You probably know that the reputation of this school for educating and graduating excellent and caring physicians and medical researchers is very well known across the country. I hope 
that we being in the heart of Detroit and Wayne County and also adjacent to all the large hospital and healthcare systems in the state and indeed in the Midwest, you will learn from the nation's uh, finest physicians and clinicians and researchers, uh, educators, while at the same time, you will be providing the much needed care for the residents of the Detroit and Wayne County. We pride ourselves on our medical students quickly interacting with real patients to gain invaluable hands-on experiences. We end up selecting about 300 students of a pool of close to 10,000 applicants. So the competition is very fierce. We have a very intentional approach to selecting students who would diverse our community, represent the diversity of our community, have the potentials of being the Wayne State University School of Medicine brand for physicians. There are more than 25,000 of them across the country, the physicians who graduated Wayne State University School of Medicine. And they practice their expertise within the immediate area, many of them, within the state, around the nation, and I would say for some around the world also. The hospital system across the nation are very accustomed to our graduates because they make outstanding residents. Matter of fact, our matching rates, and I would suspect some of my colleagues on the leadership team will think, it way exceeds the national average. Our graduates, make excellent residents. Those who proceed to fellowships make excellent fellows. Invariably with or without the fellowship, they will end up being practicing physicians in a wide variety of setting. Academic to become faculty and teachers and medical edu educators while taking care of patients and many also engaged in scholarly activity and research projects. Our school is built on solid foundation of education and service to the community. Our students through more than 70 organizations are integral to the Detroit community and beyond and provide much needed health care and other assistance to the citizens and residents around us again in Detroit metro area in Wayne County and beyond. Detroit is a very exciting place to be. Many of us on this leadership team have made Detroit home for decades. And I would dare say that most of us would not trade that for anything. The city, it's very actually in inspiring and gratifying to see how the city is reinventing itself in a renaissance for the new metropolis in the Midwest. The community is vibrant and has much to offer. Our base is Detroit, but our reputation and reach is global. This is where you want to learn medicine and conduct medical research and make a difference in the lives of the communities around you. So it's a true pleasure to welcome you to the School of Medicine at Wayne State University. And it's a pleasure to be talking to you among the team that will be also addressing you after that. Thank you all, a pleasure to have you.
Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Richard Baker, our Senior Vice Dean and Vice Dean of Medical Education. I welcome you all on this call. Um, I'd like to start with the fact that Wayne State School of Medicine, reiterating what Dean Soccer had said, Wayne State School of Medicine has a long and proud history of developing physicians who are distinctly Wayne and who are nationally recognized for how they deliver medical care. I'd like to introduce you now to the four components of our medical education mission, our mission for transformational medical education. The first component of that is that our mission is to develop and graduate a diverse cadre of physician leaders. Your intent is to just get a medical degree. This is not the school for you. Our focus totally is physician leaders, physicians who are change agents, who will make a difference. Our time, we invest money, we invest in you. Every single position of those 310 individuals that we will bring into our school, we will want to know that they will be a leader. And leadership takes many forms, but each and every one of you that we invest in, we expect you to be a leader. Secondly, for those physician leaders, we will know you will be comprehensively trained, educated to provide 21st century healthcare. Why do we even say that? Healthcare, in the last decade has changed radically. 21st century care has a very special and specific meaning. That changed the incorporation of social sciences, behavioral sciences, health system sciences, the science of learning and instruction, advanced clinical skills. All of these are incumbent for the new physician and are rapidly involved. And we will make sure that every single individual that comes here not only uh, uh, gets these skills and this knowledge, but again, we will evolve with what the, what, what the requirements are of the 21st century. But you should expect that of any good medical school that you go to. That just should be a base expectation, but that, that expectation would be fulfilled here. Because thirdly, we want physician leaders who are uniquely trained this environment, uniquely trained to provide care in a, in a complex, high acuity, diverse clinical and community environment. To give you that, those knowledge, that knowledge and those school skills that would actually uh, uh, enable you to excel um, with any patient and in any situation. And finally, embedded in who we are, any person that comes to our institution, any graduate of our institution would be trained in the context of our core mission. That's an understanding and a demonstration of social accountability and support of the health needs of, of Detroit, locally, the state, national, and even international communities that we feel that we serve serving them in a way that has measurable impact. So again, just broadly, this is who we are. This is who we are you if you came to be within our institution. This is the product that we intend and that we will produce. Um, now I'll take this opportunity to hand you off to one of my esteemed colleagues, a professor of anatomy and ophthalmology, Dr. Paul Walker. Thank you, Dr. Baker, and welcome everyone. I'm going to give you an express train ride through the uh, first uh, part of the uh, curriculum, the pre-clerkship curriculum. If you go back one slide, I think I was gonna start on a slide, but oh, okay, so I guess not. So, uh, so go to this one. So uh, one of the um, things that we feature in the curriculum is 
is elective courses that really enrich uh, your experience in the both the M1 and M2 segments of the curriculum. This is an 18 month period pre-clerkship and it precedes the clerkship training that you'll receive. And so the list of the electives are here and they're very popular. Um, the medical research, med ed research, um, community engagement is, is one of our, uh, the stamps that we put on the community uh, in Detroit. It's very popular. And there are um, some other ones listed there as well. Uh, the impact uh, elective, business of medicine and, and a CQI, uh, continuous qu quality improvement. So the, uh, Segment one is what I am mostly involved in, and I can talk about it uh, with you. So segment one is a series of courses that occur over the, the first nine months of, the, of your curriculum. There are three human body foundation courses that occur sequentially, and they really provide the structure and function of the healthy human patient. And this is foundational material that you need to um, advance to the segment two uh, curriculum, which is primarily focused on the, the pathophysiological mechanisms of disease. Now, sandwiched amongst the coursework is a series of clinical courses that you will receive information on um, as part of this webinar. And so we have people here that will talk about all of these courses. They're very important because they serve. Uh, to get you ready uh, to uh, go into your clinical years, but you're going to be front loaded with this type of training pretty much on day one of the curriculum. If I can have the next slide, please. The way each of the Human Body Foundation courses are designed is they're multidisciplinary. And so they feature these disciplines that are listed right here. So you'll get anatomy, histology, embryology, biochem, physiology, pharmacology, and neuroscience embedded across the curriculum. We also have important threads of human genetics, evidence-based medicine, where we teach you some fundamentals on epidemiology. We have some innovative imaging training uh, courses that we embed in the curriculum, and then opportunities for self-directed learning. We have a first patient project uh, that you'll be involved in, and also problem-based learning as well. Now, the way these courses work is they're structured around a systems-based curriculum with a dissection at its central core. So the first part of the, or the first three months will be on, focused on the musculoskeletal system. And you'll be dissecting in the cadaver lab, the upper and lower extremities. And then we bring you into internal medicine where you will focus on the cardiopulmonary, GI, renal, urinary systems. And so we'll be dissecting the thorax and abdomen at that time. And then in your subsequent uh, coursework, uh, we go into the reproductive and endocrine systems and then climb up to the head and neck where we will eventually um, um, study the brain as part of the central nervous system. So uh, overall, this is the basic structure of the Human Body Foundation's uh, coursework. Next slide, please. Now, as I said, uh, gross anatomy is a core element of this. It's kind of the, the jewel of Wayne State School of Medicine and one of the reasons that students uh, uh, select to come here. Uh, we have a full di uh, cadaver dissection program. It's integrated across the curriculum. We integrate the training of radiological anatomy and ultrasound. It's a very innovative program, hands-on, engages student teams with uh, active learning. The picture that's shown there is a group of uh, students on a gross anatomy team at the cadaver doing dissection. Uh, we do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, teaching and learning uh, under faculty guidance. And not only do we learn the anatomy, but we learn how to effectively communicate. And this is very important for your training and your development as a physician. Next slide, please. I'd now like to hand off to Dr. Steffes, who's going to uh, take over and talk about the clerkship and post-clerkship years. All right, thanks, Dr. Walker. This continues on the chart that Dr. Walker started and takes us into the um, years three and four, or segments three and four, as we call them, because they don't align with the uh, regular academic year. You start your clinical clerkships actually during second year. Our, our, our clinical clerkships start in April, three months ahead of a lot of schools. This allows our fourth year to start three years ahead of a lot of schools, which gives us a lot of advantages um, with the senior students. 
in addition to the clinical rotations that continue through a um, through the whole year, we have an integrated uh, longitudinal uh, course called the CRISP, and you can see what it, that stands for there, um, which meets once a month uh, in the afternoon to go over common uh, or actually topics that are common to um, all the clerkships. April of your third year, you start segment four or the senior year. Um, and you can see some of the courses there that are uh, required. Um, and uh, we also have uh, a longitudinal course and Dr. Means Teacher, or our TLC course, um, in which you uh, help Dr. Walker uh, and the Clinical Skills Center um, uh, educate the first and second year students. Um, graduation, you can see at the end there, is in uh, June of your senior year, and then you start residency. Um, next slide, please. So some of the highlights from segment three and segment four um, are, you can see the length of our clerkships there. Um, we have 12-week uh, clerkships in internal medicine and surgery. In internal medicine, you will have an experience of uh, at least one month there or a day a week in ambulatory medicine. In surgery, we do include a two-week uh, experience in anesthesia and experience in surgical subspecialties. Um, OB-GYN is six weeks, pediatrics is six weeks, and includes inpatient and outpatient experience. And then we have four weeks, uh, a block of neurology, psychiatry, and family medicine. Family medicine is um, all outpatient uh, for the third year. These are organized in week blocks. So between each 12-week um, block, there is a week of uh, vacation um, to let you recharge for the next, uh, next three or 12-week block. Now in segment four on the right side there, we have some required courses, a sub-internship, which is a competency-based evaluation, um, an emergency medicine course, which is a, a very popular course and very highly rated. Um, I talked about our, our TLC course, which is medical teaching experience, um, and then a residency preparation course that everybody has to take prior to starting residency in the spring of senior year. We also have a longitudinal course, the senior CRISP course, as far as electives go, we have 300 available courses and we're growing those courses every day as um, we increase our affiliations with hospitals in the area, our main teaching facilities and other hospitals in the area. We have flexible months, independent research months, and pretty much you design your fourth year uh, to prepare you for your specialty and to become a good physician. Next slide, please. So the, uh, we call our curriculum the Highways uh, of Excellence curriculum. And one of the themes that you have uh, with this is uh, really clinical excellence. Um, you'll learn more about this um, soon with our uh, clinical training that starts in year one, um, clinical experience, seeing patients that starts in segment two, which is spring of your first year. We, have a, we stress a continuing building of uh, clinical skills um, and circle back with all of this by teaching those same clinical skills when you're a uh, fourth year student, um, which makes you into a skilled uh, clinician and a skilled teacher of clinical skills. We have longitudinal courses that go through all four years that um, hit on themes um, that are common to whatever specialty you're going to go into. Next slide. All right, I'm going to turn it over to um, to Pinder Singh, who is our um, manager of uh, um, clinical education. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Steffes, for that introdu uh, introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, here today. We're all excited to have you. And uh, yeah, so we also make it a point to, you know, recognize our outstanding um, uh, Warrior MDs. And two programs that we have, one is the Difference Makers program, where at the end of each 12-week course that you have, you can nominate your peers, faculty, and staff members who have made a positive impact in your learning. Uh, and each nominees are highlighted across all School of Medicine uh, media and Wayne State media and, you know, receive unique uh, gifts depending on the type of swag that we have uh, at the moment. And then also we have uh, the PEARLS program where faculty, staff, and residents will report, uh, you know, accounts of students who just display excellence uh, in professionalism, whether that's, you know, in the classroom, if you're out in the clinic or community. And, um, you know, any you can get nominated at any time. And we have tiers for this. So, you know, if you get one nomination, you are featured across all School of Medicine um, 
uh, media. If you have, um, you know, two positive reports, uh, you know, you get a, a pin and also a, uh, you know, school of medicine gift item. And then thirdly, if you get three nominations, you um, also get a notation in your MSPE letter. Um, and then with that, I will uh, turn it over to our amazing uh, P41 uh, course director, Dr. Markowitz. Thank you very much, Depender. I'm Dr. Andrew Markowitz. I, uh, I'm the course director for P41. At the moment, Dr. Latanya Riddle-Jones is our director for P42. These are longitudinal courses through your first and your second segments. They are small group, flipped classroom style learning where we also emphasize self-directed learning. These are going to help prepare you for your clerkships and residency and becoming a practicing physician to expand on everything that uh, Dr. Baker and Walker and Stephis has already talked about. The, the importance of P4 and the social sciences has been emerging, as Dr. Baker pointed out, since Dr. Flexner did his research in 1910. For over 100 years, there was very little change in undergraduate medical education with the two pillars of basic sciences and clerkships. And um, in 2013, the AMA developed a consortium where they determined that it was important to include health system sciences. So what are those? Those are all the factors in the lives of patients that influence their well-being, the social determinants of health and health disparities, structure of the health system itself, societal factors, communication, information technology. So our goal is to effectively improve patients' health at the individual, community, and population level. So what P4 is going to do is teach you about special patient populations, social and ethical issues in medicine, specific history taking strategies, all of which will make you a more well-rounded and effective member of the patient team care later on. So you can see we, when this course first started, I think it was even P2, now it's expanded to P4, population, patient, physician, and professionalism. As we study all of these different determinants, you're also going to learn about the interventions, as, as Dr. Baker spoke about, you, you need to learn about accountability. So what interventions, these are just gonna be some of them that we will study to improve health outcomes. Screening procedures, motivational interviewing techniques, treatment recommendations, counseling techniques, lifestyle risk factor management, preventive health strategies, and empathetic listening. Um, next slide, please. So this is the current topics for the class of 2026. As, as you can see, by exploring sensitive topics and learning how to communicate with the diverse population, students' attitudes as well as their knowledge and skills will be developed with a concentrated focus on understanding the patient's perspective leading to true patient-centered care. We examine strategies to identify and address structural racism, physician bias, and chronic stress amongst a lot of other topics here to advocate more effectively for the health of the patients and populations, including those who are from vulnerable and marginalized communities. So for example, just to take a deeper dive, if we looked at uh, unit 10 on uh, exploring the LGBTQ plus community, within that, we'll discuss ethical dilemmas affecting the transgender population. We'll learn how to demonstrate cultural humility in regard to the concerns of the LGBTQ community, learn to differentiate between sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, practice a non-judgmental approach to inquiring about different lifestyles, and um, learn how to make your office welcoming to LGBTQ patients. So within each of these units, there's extensive exploration of the topics, and we've also greatly expanded the ethics component of P4. So again, this is a longitudinal course. Next slide. So that is a, a brief summary of P4-1. You'll continue on during P4-2. These are some of the current topics, um, as you see included in the health system science. 
food insecurity, veterans health, individuals living with disabilities, correctional health, homeless and housing insecurity, and environmental justice. In segment two, there are a number of panels, um, including people who have lived experience with a lot of these situations, as well as experts in the field, where then you break down into small groups for further discussion. There's also research presentations, reflections, and self-assessments. So with that, I would like to turn the next segment on to our next graduate of Wayne, Dr. Joshua Collins. Thank you, Dr. Markowitz. I, I appreciate that introduction. And uh, as was just mentioned, I am a very proud graduate of uh, Wayne State University School of Medicine, class of 2010. And I've been a member of the, uh, the medical student education community ever since then. Um, I have the wonderful pleasure in my role of working with the team who is most often referred to as the, the Cato Clinical Skills Center on clinical education team. Um, we run very much concurrently and in parallel and in direct collaboration with uh, Dr. Markowitz and the P4 team, um, as well as who you'll hear after me, Dr. Mendez and the community engagement team. In addition to Dr. Walker uh, and the rest of the pre-clerkship educational team. So in essence, I, we, we put together this slide to, to help complement things that were mentioned by Dr. Steffes earlier in this presentation that a lot of these activities start as early as literally your first day in, uh, in, in pre-clerkship learning and extend all the way through your last days in medical school. So we start by just teaching you the fundamental skills. We get you early exposure. They just mentioned you start in that first week of medical school, learning how to employ those, those characteristics of taking a history, introducing yourself to a patient. How do we dress? How do we look? How do we engage with our patients? All of this is done in simulation-based medical education. You will come to our, our clinical skills center. You will engage with simulated and standardized patients. We do this in competency-based assessment standards. For those who don't know what that is, that is really demonstrating your knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors that are specifically defined in varying and shifting environments and situations. And we'll challenge you with that over the course of the, of the entire pre-clerkship curriculum. Complementing what Dr. Markowitz just spoke about in the P4 curriculum, you learn about a lot about vulnerable and unique and special populations and topics. We will provide you opportunities to put those that learning into practice with simulated patients. And the outcome from the first segment component of this course, referred to as clinical skills one, is that you will or you will come out of there being a value add to any clinic that you join as part of segment two. I know that there have been a lot of questions up here about early exposure to volunteer clinics. There are going to be plenty of those opportunities, and those can further complement the learning that you're doing in this formal course. So as you advance through the curriculum, you, you have advancing clinical skills. So we get you ready for the clerkships. The clinical skills two course is set up so that you are learning advanced skills and building off the knowledge and the skills that you've already developed, getting you ready for the specific clerkships that you're going to enter into during segment three. You build a lot upon that foundational skill, and it runs concurrent with this, this clerkship called the CEC, this is the Clinical Experiential Clerkship. And that's where you're actually going to enter into clinics, oftentimes on a weekly or biweekly basis. And you will be putting this into practice, all of these skills that you're learning with real patients. And then as you progress through the, to, through the clerkship portion of the curriculum and then into the post-clerkship phase, so segments three and four, you have plenty of opportunities to serve as a near peer educator. There are lots of opportunities informally on the wards. You'll have opportunities in clinics. And then there's more formalized opportunities through this longitudinal teaching course during M4 segment, or segment four, where you get to come back to the clinical skill centers and other sites to actually practice teaching. Um, we do have another slide here, but it's really just rehashing what we talked about here. So in segment one, it was, was as was demonstrated earlier by Dr. Walker, you have um, clinical skills one, which runs concurrent with the uh, P41 course, and then P, uh, uh, clinical skills two, which runs concurrent with P42 and the, the CEC. 
The one thing missing from the slide is the community engagement service learning side, which I will hand it off to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Mendez, uh, to uh, give you more uh, information on that. Thank you, Dr. Collins. And it's my pleasure today to welcome you to Wayne State School of Medicine. Uh, my um, uh, 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 title is Dr. Uh, Jennifer Mendez, and I direct our community engagement service learning program. Every one of you that attend Wayne State will complete 35 hours of clinical and uh, mentoring outreach in the community in year one and again in year two. So you have a total of 75 hours. Um, it's at the high level of most medical schools. We are invested in our Detroit community. We care for a very diverse population. And I know many of you in the chat have been asking about ethnic groups. And I'm sure uh, the students that will be presenting after me will be able to tell you more about those. Our program runs um, from birth to grave. And I'll give you one example of when I'm in grave. Uh, during COVID, we have a number of patients that had passed away and our students helped the families in preparing and getting them information ready for burial. So not only do we do it from um, birth, we do it up to helping families with grave. Next slide, please. In um, total, year one and year two students, about 600 of them, complete 18,000 clinical hours uh, annually. And in order to uh, participate in our diverse clinics, we do have introductory language sessions in Arabic, Hindi, Mandarin, Cantonese, as well as sign language. All of our projects that our teams work on are team-based. So um, I have two links here and it'll be put in the chat for you. You will be able to see the projects that have been completed by our students uh, during COVID as well as currently what they are doing. In addition, we have interprofessional Zoom home visits at the moment with um, volunteer patients in the community. These are done with our pharmacy, OT, nursing, PA, and dental students from University of Detroit Mercy. This is your year two program. In, um, in, as part of your first year course, we work on a lot of growth mindset with you to get you ready from what you had done in high school and undergraduate to become a part of what we are doing now in uh, your medical school level. So you'll see the next link that you have, Digital Commons, will also show you some things about the storyboards and the mask that we are creating. Next slide, please. I want to introduce our my peers, Dr. Eva Venio, who is going to talk to you about health and wellness. And I'm sure Dr. Chadwell will be uh, uh, talking to you a little later. Thank you for your time. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mendes, for the introduction. Um, so I am representing Student Affairs on behalf of Dr. Chadwell and myself. And I wanted to share with you that in the Office of Student Affairs, we're absolutely committed to student success through your development as both a person as well as a future physician. Um, in this office, we've got people that can support you and provide you with re like resources that can ensure you your very best student experience. They work with leaders across the medical school to create a true culture of wellness, ensure that you've got access to services, build a really strong community in that, in both your learning as well as your service to the city of Detroit. Um, I'm excited whenever someone's at the very start of their journey because I think there's so much growth that occurs across the four years of medical school, and we're really here to see you through every single step of, of the way. Next slide, please. So you may have heard that we are a very large medical school, and I truly think that with that size come a lot more opportunities, including the fact that there's over 80 different student organizations, and you'll hear about those later directly from students. But I wanted to let you know that students are truly at the heart of everything that we do in student affairs, um, and we li liaison with, with many of our student leaders. At Wayne, as a medical student, you really have a, a way to get an impact early on, both locally as well as even on a national stage. And uh, I want to share some pictures with you. The, the first one here on the left has um, 
drawings that are organized through our art and medicine student organization that links directly with our anatomy curriculum. And in the one on the right is a group of students who are participating in the um, American Medical Association. They're attending a national meeting where they're presenting some resolutions. Next slide. The other thing that's a wonderful aspect of student affairs is that we get to celebrate so many of your milestones with you. This is, you know, from orientation all the way through graduation. What you see here is our white coat ceremony that occurred really just a few months ago. We've got Dean Chadwell here, uh, who's our associate dean of students, coding one of our first year medical students. And I hope some of the like excitement shows through because it really is a fun event that, that celebrates your entry into to medical school. And there's a lot of other milestones that we really enjoy celebrating with you as you grow to, to be a physician. Next slide. So the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, is really support services, because everybody needs support at some point during, during you know, their journey through life. And we have a lot of different ways to meet diverse needs. So there's academic counseling that's accomplished through that collaboration of faculty, your course and clerkship directors, the Office of Teaching and Learning, who you'll hear from, um, and our student affairs staff just to provide whatever academic assistance you may need. We also have personal counseling provided by a class counselor. They each have significant experience. They all have a master's or a PhD. And this is somebody that follows the entire class longitudinally. So you've got your person throughout the four years um, to connect you to resources and to check in with. And then every one of our students has access to confidential mental health services, which are outside of the medical school should they need them at any point. And then we partner with a few services like MyMD2B and Wellbeing Index. MyMD2B is a really nice program that actually sends email communication about what it's like to be a medical student. And it's linked with our, with our program. And they send it not only to students, but any support givers that they sign up. And then Wellbeing Index provides national resources as well as some evidence-based um, wellness surveys. Next slide. So I hope you're getting to see that we really have a pretty strong commitment to um, wellness of our medical students. It's strong enough that we actually place it directly in our curriculum in a deliberate longitudinal way. Um, we've got students that have a certificate in mental health first aid training, our entire first year class actually within the first few weeks of starting in medical school. And I, I have a few wellness initiatives here uh, that are part of our curriculum, a physical wellness session, and then, um, a fun optional event that's our walk with a doc program that as you can see links some mentorship with some time outside. Uh, next slide please. So when it comes to staying well, um, part of that is really figuring out what you want to do, what specialty you want to go into, and being able to um, learn about how to do that throughout your four years during medical school. And so there's a lot of different ways that um, we offer career planning options from accessing our AMC resource centers to specialty advising dinners to one-on-one -on -one advising with our faculty for whatever your specialty of choice may be. Next slide. All right, so what I wanna finish on is that our goal is really to prepare you for a successful finish. Uh, this is what it was like for these students back in June of 2022. So I know everyone on this call, you're trying to prepare for the next months and the start of medical school, but we've got this long game in mind. You know, We want you to have a successful finish with a successful match. And, and so I just wanna wish you all the best on, on your journey over these next years. And I, I am gonna introduce our next speaker. Next slide. So this is um, Dr. Donovan Roy, who's Vice Dean of in Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Winnie Young. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, next slide. So the Office of uh, IDEAL has been in existence here at Wayne State for over 50 years. Some of the things that we focus on is recruiting more diversity to our campus. Diversity is a really important component of being here at Wayne State. So one of the things that we do is not only go to local and regional and national uh, conference to recruit more diversity for our, for our school, but we also too have pathway programs and service to increase diversity. We have one of the first post back programs, which really focus on, on helping students become more competitive uh, candidates for our, pro, for our medical program. 
This program is over well over 50 years. Wayne State can boast and brag that we do have the first post back program, medical program in the nation. We also too really focus on helping our the students in the city of Detroit really provide them with opportunity to get college credit through our Wayne State University Medical High School School and uh, Dual Enrollment Program. And we also do have a medical mentorship program, pipeline program, really which focuses on helping uh, juniors and seniors in college really understand how to apply to medical school. Um, Belong is very important component of our, our campus. So we work closely with our, our students and faculty and staff to really have uh, to do a lot of uh, dialogue uh, circle, which focus on uh, training facilitators, how uh, facilitators on how to facilitate anti-racist um, uh, presentation, how to have those tough conversations. We also too invite speakers throughout the year to share their personal and prof professional experience as being a, a black indigenous people of color physician. And also too, these physicians also to help us mentor our students who are currently in our curriculum. So we provide a lot of support to students. Our next, so diversity matters here at Wayne State uh, School of Medicine. So our student body, we want our student body, our faculty and senior administration to reflect the city of Detroit, which is a very uh, multicultural uh, community. <clears throat> So one of the things that we do is in this is we really focus on addressing health disparities, uh, health equity, and also social determinant health in our curriculum. And the way that we do this is with the help with uh, our diversity advisory council and our diversity equity inclusion by chairs committee, which comprise of administrators, faculty, and senior administrators that really help us really go out there and help us really eliminate some of the uh, health health inequalities and health disparities within the city of Detroit. We also have many of our multicultural student organizations that are represented on these executive boards, which includes uh, our Black Medical Associations, our La La Latino Medical Student Association, and our, our Student National Medical Association. One of the wonderful things about Wayne State School of Medicine is out of 185 medical school, we're ranked 28th in the nation for being the most diverse medical school in the country. Even though that is a, 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 even though we're almost reaching the top 25, we really want to reach to be one of the top 10 most diverse schools in the country. So I'm going to introduce my next speaker. And uh, Zaza Booker, uh, uh, Dr. Booker is going to talk about learning and teaching. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm here to talk about the Office of Learning and Teaching. Um, our office is really committed to the development and the discovery and the dissemination of um, meaningful educational programs. We really work in efforts to provide students and faculty uh, with the um, support so that we can promote academic success. Um, we collaborate with both uh, faculty and the campus community in order to support students. And our aim is to help to foster and develop master adaptive learners. Um, our mission is to, again, help to provide educational programs that promote um, innovation in our medical school. Next slide. So to describe our office a little further, I call it the three P's and what we aim to do here in our office is to really prepare and uh, help to promote physicians who exemplify lifelong learning and self-regulated learning. Uh, that's really important in medical school. Uh, we also want to provide specialized interprofessional support to our faculty um, in helping support their uh, teaching. And then lastly, we want to promote a humanistic approach to physician training. Um, and I also like to add that it's uh, humanistic and holistic, right? So uh, we provide support that goes beyond uh, academics. And we realize that you are human and individuals and you have lives outside of uh, schoolwork. So we help to promote that holistic approach to education. So our next slide, I'm sorry. Um, our team is uh, comprised of uh, these individuals that you see on the screen, uh, our 
Department Administrator Ms. Sherman helps to provide support to our learning communities, and she's also the person who helps our office run uh, efficiently. Um, Dr. Reed provides uh, educational support. She's also the director of our Near Peer Learning Program that I'm going to tell you about a little later. And um, again, she provides pr support to both students and faculty here at Wayne State. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Makongo, who is uh, also a learning specialist like myself. Both of us actually work directly with students. So we are the go-to people if you uh, have any questions or need uh, learning support. We work with students both um, in the segments that you have throughout uh, medical education, but also we help to provide support to our students who are preparing for uh, board exams. So, um, and then lastly, we have a curriculum specialist who's just joining our team, she's new, and she's gonna help us to support our faculty with curriculum and instruction support. So uh, here's our academic support structure. Um, the most important thing to know is that there is a system in place to help you or to help students if they uh, struggle. And so we operate on a multi-tiered system. This system is, uh, it operates in order to rapidly identify students who are in trouble. Um, and as you can see, there's several tiers. And what we try to do is make sure that we provide students with interventions and supports before things get too bad, right? We always say, come see us before things get really bad. So our system of support is there to provide you with the support you need so that you can stay here. Um, and then lastly, uh, I said I was going to talk a little bit about our students as teachers program. If you go to the next slide. Okay. Um, and lastly, uh, as far as support is concerned, we also have a student as teachers program where uh, we have our um, upperclassmen who actually help support and provide tutoring services, small group and content review sessions. Um, they provide lab support as well as step prep content review sessions. So they really cover a lot of ground and we really depend on our students. So um, look forward to that if you are uh, interested in helping to uh, provide services to your peers. There is a program in place and these are the support structures that are provided in the Office of Learning and Teaching. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, we are going to take a Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're looking forward to this part of the programming, which will be a lot uh, from the students. And the first person that we're going to introduce is Dr. Joseph Dunbar. Dr. Dunbar is going to talk to you about research and scholarly concentrations. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am the past a professor and chairman of the Department of Physiology, as well as director of medical student research. Through today's presentation, you heard about that one of the features that we try to enhance is while going to school, that your learning does not stop there, but you become a lifelong learner. And to become a lifelong learner, you have to know how to produce, not only learn new additional information, but you also have to learn how to produce new information. All came to, will be coming to medical school with some background in research and also some curiosity about, about why some certain things are the way they are. And you've often asked, how is it that new information is generated? And it's generated by people that are curious and have doing research and developing new uh, opportunity, uh, new information. So our scholarly concentration allows our uh, academics enhancement of skills, and, and for all of you to develop 
career exploration, and this what this does is cultivate habits of scholarly research and inquiry. Now, one of the unique features of our research and scholarly concentration that it is individualized. We do not approach this from the standpoint of everybody's doing the same thing, but different individuals have different curiosities and we try to uh, tailor your research, our scholarly experience around an individualized activity. And this will allow you to develop skills related to that particular activity, be creative, develop critical thinking skills, and excel in an area of academic medicine. And this is very important for your future because once you start excelling, this is, you will have some ownership around a particular knowledge base. This, these can span a wide variety of activities, such as it can be community-based, healthcare policy, as well as the standard uh, emerging technologies and uh, standard basic uh, investigations. Another unique feature of our program that is longitudinal across your entire medical school curriculum. You can start early and, and finish in your fourth year where you are will be expected to finish up most of your electives. And this will give you an opportunity not only just to finish, but to be able to publish some of your material. Also, again, it is individualized and you will be able to go in depth in a particular area. And this also includes an in-depth literature review so that you can know all of the existing data and in that particular special specialty. In the next slide, the scholarly concentrations can be in a variety of areas. However, our strength here at Wayne is that we have opportunities for students with scholarly concentrations in the basic sciences, uh, which is classical uh, bench research, clinical sciences that you can do from a clinical perspective. We help have a very robust women's health program that investigate a number of urban health issues, especially as it relates to women. Many of our students are very interested in that type of work. And we have a public health and community engagement. You've heard earlier that all of our students participate in community engagement. But however, for those of you that are really interested in making a difference in analyzing what you are doing and whether or not it has a positive impact or not, this you can a role the clinical uh, community engagement into a real scholarly activity. In medical education, many of our students are interested in improving the educational process. Historically, a lot of students, when they come to medical school in any type of educational setting, they have ideas of how they could make it better. And this will give you an opportunity for those of you that's interested in that to add up, uh, do studies in improving the medical education. And some of you that are, don't want to be limited here to Detroit or, or the, in our local environment, we have a program in global health where you can engage in scholarly work that are that's much uh, wider and global. Now, another very important feature of our work is that all of the students will have to have a mentor. A mentor is sometimes overused, but the idea of having a mentor is really important in any type of scholarly work that anyone will do, that includes students, professors, or anyone else. And this is what the mentor is expected to provide. So a mentor, first of all, is expected to help the students develop a realistic project that they can work on and the scope that is realistic for the student. This is important because uh, a realistic scope is prevents students from uh, tackling, trying to tackle something that they will never be able to complete. The mentor will orient the student to uh, the, the group. Almost all scholarly work is done 
as a, with a team approach. And so hopefully individuals, although they, they have ideas, but they will be a part of an investigative team well, along with the mentor. The mentor will be available to meet with the student to help supervise them, give them feedback, and provide resources for the student to be able to complete the work because almost any type of scholarly work requires some type of resources. And provide the guidance and support necessary for the completion of the project and, and give the student feedback on their performance. And very, very important, the mentor then can provide professional development uh, guidance throughout the student's career. And when the students are participating in some work, they can introduce them to the leaders in the field so that they can be known, attend meetings that we can, the Office of Medical Student Research help, can help with. And very importantly, as you proceed through life, provide a reference for you as, as, your, as you proceed through residency and beyond. So this is our scholarly concentration, and this is would be very enjoyable as an elective. I would like to now introduce you to our next presenter, Dr. Jason Boozer. He's Assistant Dean of Continuous Quality Improvement and Compliance, Dr. Boozer. Thank you, Dr. Dunbar. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So as Dr. Dunbar had talked about, um, one of the things about Wayne State University School of Medicine that's very unique is that individualized uh, learning experience where students really get to not only learn the basics of medicine, the knowledge and skills needed to practice. However, your journey um, that you'll be taking is to also enhance and build upon areas that you have interested, interest in. And as been talked about uh, today, research can take on many different aspects. It's, uh, it could be clinical research, it can be foundational medicine research, um, it can occur in the community, it can occur in a lab. One of the opportunities, actually very unique opportunities we here have here at Wayne State University School of Medicine is we also participate in educational research, specifically medical education research. And like other forms of research, medical education research is research in action. It is meant to address uh, particular issues or problems or answer questions of uh, immediate need to individuals or organizations. And what makes this approach very unique is not only is it um, action oriented and you can see direct results, is the approach we take here is the research is also student focused, student facing and student led. And so I just wanna call your brief attention to three different projects we've had come up in the past two or three years. The first one, um, the students you see listed along with some of our faculty advisors, wanted to look at student interactions in the community and clinical sites. And particularly is ensuring the training of students prior to entering um, whether community health, a community health setting or a clinical setting to be fully prepared um, on how to communicate and deal with patients um, and how to be part of a larger team. And this was based on some observations that students had when they were doing community work uh, while here in their first year. So what they went ahead and did is they wanted to uh, put together a curriculum. So they worked with Drs. Eva Wainio, Chadwell, and Levine. And over the course of their time here, approximately three and a half years, they were able to put together a training curriculum now that is now offered to all of our students on an annual basis to help prepare them as they go into the clinical sites. And again, not only the research uh, was done by them, but their development and implementation and evaluation of that curriculum was done as well. And are currently in the process of publishing this nationally to serve as a national standard of how this training should be done across the United States. Another very interesting project that came up, again, as students were involved in medical education research is 
during the pandemic, as vaccines were developing for COVID-19, one of our students, uh, Dustin Levinson, was nearing the end of her second year in medical school and ready to transition into clerkships. And based on what she was seeing in the community and around her, she was interested to know specifically as a future physician, but more importantly, as a student that will be in clinics um, within a couple of months, how well are we prepared? How well prepared are we to have communications with patients regarding vaccinations? What are the facts? What is the misinformation? But more importantly, how do you have those conversations with patients? And so she worked with actually a faculty member here who was instrumental in helping develop and test the COVID-19 vaccine, one of them, and putting together a workshop that was offered to all of our students going into clerkships or those already in clerkships in terms of how to prepare, how to um, anticipate these questions and how to communicate. Similarly, we had another student um, last year who is interested in the health of individuals with disabilities. And for those of you that followed the national news today, talking about how individuals with physical disabilities are less likely to receive health care, she was interested from the other side is, are we training our students in how to do a history and physical with patients with these type of disabilities? So she worked with a learning specialist and again, and was able to develop a workshop that hopefully we'll be implementing into our full curriculum to train students. So these are just some brief examples of how students have gotten involved in medical education research and have given directly back, not only to the School of Medicine in real time, but also influencing hopefully what will be occurring nationally in terms of training of medical students. With this, I would like to now turn it over to Ms. Jenna Carter for her presentation. Thanks so much, Dr. Buza. Um, okay, so uh, as Dr. Bruza said, my name is Jenna, and I am a current student here in the MD-PhD program at Wayne, and I'm going to talk to you guys about some of our numerous and diverse research opportunities for medical students. I know a lot of you have been asking in the chat about that. Um, so like Dr. Bruza said, there is medical education, which is very unique and robust here at Wayne State, but we also, of course, have a lot of opportunities in um, some of the more uh, traditional routes, such as basic science research and clinical research. And I'm also gonna talk about kind of community service research that our students are very well known for. Um, so as you may or may not know, Wayne State, is a Wayne State University is an R1 research institute, and we pride ourselves on our contributions to diverse areas of research. This is a huge benefit to our medical students as there's many faculty doing research in diverse fields, both within the School of Medicine, but also around campus to serve the great and the ICV is great mentors to our medical students. As Dr. Dunbar mentioned previously, students can engage with mentors and research through some of our structured programs, such as the research electives or scholarly concentrations, but a lot of them also um, partake in research independently um, through independent mentorship. Our students present their research both uh, local at university conferences, but also nationally and internationally. And there's a lot of support from the School of Medicine and the alumni office to attend these conferences. Um, so importantly, our most recent anonymous survey um, done by students, students reported they were highly satisfied with research opportunities here at Wayne. So I think it's important to highlight um, what our current students say about our kind of research environment. As I mentioned, Wayne State does a great job at giving students the opportunity to present research here at the university uh, and at one such, such symposium is our medical student research symposium. On the right here are some examples of students who won awards for their research in basic science areas like translational neuroscience with memory function in rats, cancer biology studies on metastases in ovarian cancer, and in the areas of public health with a study on climate and COVID-19. Next slide. Um, we also have many opportunities to participate in clinical research with our esteemed faculty and residents at our numerous clinical affiliations. We are fortunate to be at the center of many medical campuses here in Detroit and have clinical partnerships within the Detroit Medical Center, the VA of Detroit, Henry Ford Hospital, Beaumont Ascension, Carmanos Cancer Institute, which is the only comprehensive cancer institute in Michigan, as well as Children's Hospital Michigan, Kresge Eye Institute, and several other new affiliations in the greater Detroit area. 
Additionally, we have numerous student run clinics that will be highlighted later on and students participate in clinical and community based research projects through those. This is to say that there is many ways in which students uh, find mentors in their areas of interest and work with faculty and residents on and other students to complete diverse research projects. Um, I have highlighted here on the right some of the projects that won awards at this year's symposium, including uh, PTSD and refugee populations, predictive factors of hospital stays and children with dog bites, and healthcare resources and heart attack patients. Next slide. Okay. Um, so I did want to highlight, um, you know, like Dr. Buza mentioned, performing with medical education is a real strong, strong point and unique at Wayne. Also, our research and community engagement and public health is very uh, unique here at Wayne. Um, there's the biggest opportunity for research that makes Wayne unique and which our students are known for is research and community engagement and public health. Uh, I wanted to highlight this as well to demonstrate that there's many ways to be active at research here at Wayne. So it's not just a stereotypical clinic or basic science research, though we certainly have a lot of that. There's many ways to engage in research with your unique passions. Um, students here in Wayne are heavily involved in community engagement from day one, and many of our student organizations create relationships with community organizations to better support our Detroit community. In addition, uh, bringing programs meaningful and engagement, engagement to our community, many of the students find ways through their organizations to collaborate on community research projects, such as the one on the right where students looked at social determinants of healthcare access in our Latinx communities, the impact of COVID on those experiencing homelessness in Detroit. And at the bottom, you can see a picture of one of our former students who investigated the use of drones to deliver Narcan and in instances of opioid overdoses in urban areas. These are just a few ways of which warrior medical students engage with research. And I will now pass it off to one of our esteemed third year medical students, Cedric, to talk more about advocacy opportunities here at Wayne. Thank you, Jenna. I mean, just like all the speakers before me have mentioned, there's numerous ways to get involved in the local community in relation to research, um, but there's also opportunities to be engaged through advocacy. And today I'll be talking to you about some examples of that um, in some ways in which our students and our uh, faculty show up for our Detroit community. Um, one of these examples is the program that myself and two of my classmate colleagues, as well as two faculty, um, helped to create, which is called Healing Between the Lines. Um, and this program is an innovative cur uh, curriculum to teach about the intersection of structural racism and health um, while working with the Detroit community to develop upstream policies to tackle barriers to healthy outcomes. Um, and one of the, the unique things that we did when we put together this program was that we built it with the community. Um, it really started to reframe, you know, who do we see as experts of health and putting our community members at the forefront of our, uh, of our medical education. Um, so you can see here that this common theme of collaboration with our residents in the city um, and really working together to improve the health inequities that we see here locally in Detroit. Um, further examples of these type of programs can also be seen in our work to increase the diversity that we see um, coming for our students into this medical pathway. Um, some of these programs, which we can see at the bottom, um, are one of our pinnacle programs, Reach Out to You, which was founded by Dr. Tynes and Dr. King um, about 15, over 15 years ago which brings over 200 young youth and from the city of Detroit to Wayne State's campus to expose them to healthcare careers um, by showing them the anatomy lab, as well as by inspiring them to pursue medicine as a career. Another such program, which was created um, out of Henry Ford under the leadership of Dr. Martina Caldwell was a summer to pathways to healthcare and clinical research program in which numerous Wayne State students helped to inspire and motivate local high school students into this pathway as well. And these are just two examples of different ways in which Wayne State students show up and, and show out in terms of advocacy, as well as increasing the pathway. Next, you can see two of our really big examples of our national role in advocacy, one through our OSR program, which is the Organization of Student Representatives, and the second through the AMA. The first, our OSR, is a national representative group, um, student group, that operates out of every medical institution across the country. Due to our, our school's large size, each class has one national representative that serves as a liaison between that class and the national forefront to communicate innovations, but also to make sure that we're represented in the national conversation and trajectory of where medical education is heading. So as you can see here, our OSR has continue, continued to be active in representing not only Wayne State, but Michigan. Um, one of the ways in which we're active is that we actively serve on advisory council um, providing insight and, and, and information 
on how that uh, on ways in which medical schools can work to increase the diverse applicants and matriculants to medical schools. Another way is one of our one of my colleagues in OSR is actually leading a national step one pass fail study in which is in which they're looking at the different ways in which medical schools are now assisting their students to match successfully um, now that we've entered this realm of a pass fail for the step one. Secondly, when we look at the work that our uh, association of uh, our American Medical Association student group has been doing, we've been known throughout the years for our contributions to policy and regulations on the national level. Here, we've contributed to, to local, state, and national level policies to influence and help to shape the frame in which we all navigate as a community. And on the right hand side, you can see some of the most recent policies and actions that our students have came up with. Um, and you can see from their different distinctions, whether they were adopted into policy, referred for study or reaffirmed. And a lot of these policies that we see actually go on to help to improve the outcomes of our communities. So with both of those examples, you can really see how our students really move beyond just showing up and, and, and participating in medical education, but now look at research as well as advocacy to improve the lives of our communities. And with that, I'll turn it over to Alexis Malecki, who will be talking about our service learning projects. Hello, thank you all so much. My name is Alexis. I am a second year here at Wayne State and Rachel and I today are gonna to tell you a little bit more about service learning here, as well as our specific organization called Common Threads. So the service learning curriculum is composed of two aspects of students earning outreach hours and clinical hours each semester. And so outreach hours can be earned at a wide variety of community service opportunities held by student orgs such as Common Threads. And clinical hours can be earned by volunteering at one of our many student-run clinics that you'll hear about later, or some more medically oriented events held by student orgs or student interest groups. And with this curriculum, each class has different service learning reps that do research to evaluate the efficacy of this curriculum and its impact, the impacts of its programs. So for a little bit more about how um, outreach hours work and how you can learn how you can earn them. I'll tell you a little bit about our organization, Common Threads, who we are. We are an interest group combining fiber arts, which includes things like crochet, knitting, embroidery, with community outreach to promote student wellness, service learning, and research. And most importantly, we accept volunteers of all skill levels, and there's no prior experience necessary to volunteer with us. Uh, so one of our current big initiatives is our crochet flaring sleeping mats. And we came up with this initiative because like many big cities, Detroit has a large population of people experiencing homelessness. And our goal is to be able to provide lightweight, easy to clean, durable sleeping mats to community members. And so what this process looks like is we collect um, donated used grocery bags from students. And then at our volunteer events for outreach hours, students are able to process these grocery bags into yarn that we call PLARN, P-L-A-R-N. And then we're able to teach our students how to crochet this yarn into sleeping mats. And then my partner, Rachel, is gonna tell you a little bit more about what we do next. Good evening, everyone. So moving forward, next steps that we're planning to take is to distribute these sleeping mats that we have now through other student-led organizations like Street Med and Cass Clinic here. And then we have a research project that's going to be underway soon to evaluate the actual impact of receiving these sleeping mats on the lives of the people who we give them to. So for incoming students, there's a lot of ways that you can get involved. You can continue this initiative itself or other similar initiatives by getting involved with our organization, Common Threads, and becoming a part of the eboard. You can also create your own student interest group. Alexis and I are part of the founding committee of Common Threads, so we can speak specifically, personally to that process and how accessible and established it is. So don't be intimidated. If you have an idea, you definitely should go ahead and try and make it happen. It's very well established and accessible here. And you can also, if you do start something yourself, you can conduct your own research into the impact that your group has on the community, just like we we're doing. You've heard already about how accessible mentors here are. So something you can absolutely do. Something you've also heard about tonight is the student-led evaluation of the curriculum. And one way you can get involved with that is by becoming a service learning representative. Service learning representatives evaluate the service learning curriculum here at Wayne State through student-led research. One uh, project that was conducted last year 
looked at the different patient education strategies and found that there's a discrepancy between the perceived importance that students rank these strategies at and how often they implement them. But it did reveal that students benefit from a course that supports and fosters professional development during the preclinical and clinical years. For example, another project that we have going on for this year now is dedicated to professional development throughout medical school and has found in preliminary data that students do feel that the current service learning course has improved their professional development. So that's again, as students have said before, lending further credence to how the students themselves feel about the curriculum. So now I'd like to hand it over to our panel of students who are involved with the free health clinics. We're going to tell you about another great way you can get involved here. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Ramaya. Are you guys all able to hear me? I hope so. Um, so I'm a current second year student um, who is uh, one of the outreach coordinators of the Islamic Medical Student Association. Um, so one thing you'll know about Wayne as we've been speaking about is how important service is to our students and to our mission. Um, and health, the health unit on Davidson Avenue or Huda Clinic is just one example of the many free clinics that we have. Um, so Huda Clinic is a a clinic, a free health clinic for uninsured and underinsured patients. It's about five miles away from campus, and its mission is to improve the lives of those in need through comprehensive healthcare, education, and resources. Um, I specifically was a volunteer coordinator for the clinic uh, back in my undergrad, and I wanted to continue that work into my medical education, which is why I decided to continue to do that. Um, with my involvement in Hilda Clinic now, uh, but medical students in general are able to gain really great hands-on experience. You guys are the ones that are conducting the physical exams, writing the notes, presenting the cases, um, doing everything that typically you would do as a third and fourth year student, you're able to do in your first and second year. Um, and just some of the services that we provide, uh, free services uh, for anyone that's uninsured and underinsured, including primary care and a fully functional pharmacy, um, dental care, mental health services, and a lot of specialties that are rotating in our clinic. So if there is a specialty that you are interested in, uh, likely the clinic will have opportunities for you to shadow them. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda. I'm an M2 here at Wayne State as well. And I'm a clinic coordinator for Amigos Medicals Clinic. So our mission is basically to uh, focus on serving the Latinx community here in Detroit. Um, and so our clinic is located in Southwest Detroit, uh, which of course is a very dominant uh, Hispanic community, Spanish speaking and all of that. So some of the things that we do is provide blood pressure, we do blood glucose, A1Cs, uh, cholesterol checks. So we're primarily a prevention screening uh, clinic. And so our volunteers get the chance to work on these skills, interview patients, as well as use our our EMRs um, in order to have like familiarity with that. But um, of course, like some of our uh, patients are Spanish speaking. And so some of our volunteers even get the opportunity to practice Spanish if they um, would like to do so. So that's a good opportunity if you're willing to do that. Uh, and we always have a physician, of course, with us um, who's able to address specific patient concerns. But for the most part, um, our volunteers and me or whatever coordinator is present on that day um, are the ones ones that handle the entire um, encounter. And of course, the reason why um, I specifically decided to join um, was because of a lot of our patients uh, lack a primary care provider. And so it's really important to uh, extend uh, prevention screening services in order to connect patients to resources that they might need. Um, and so this is what we primarily focus on. And our location is also centered in the Ford Research Center, which has other resources, not just uh, medically related, but uh, legally, um, and as well as helping connect patients to jobs and stuff like that. So it's a really great opportunity if you're willing to do so. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole. I'm the Vice President of Street Medicine Detroit, and I'm also an M2. Um, so Street Med's mission is to ensure access quality medical care for Detroit's often unreached houseless population. Um, so we conduct direct and regular outreach to try to bridge the gaps um, between the homeless and medical communities um, by trying to rebuild relationships and offering companionship and respect. Um, we try to seek, or we seek to address not only their healthcare needs, but also their psychosocial needs. As for our location, we don't have a fixed location. We go directly to our patients, whether that be in homeless shelters or on the streets of Detroit. Personally, I chose to join Street, I chose to join Street Med because 
Um, especially in Detroit, houseless folks just face so many additional barriers to health and are so used to um, often being ignored. And I really appreciate how through Street Medicine, we get the opportunity and privilege to try to care for them as whole people deserving of respect, compassion, and dignity. Um, I've listed the service we provide on the screen since there's a lot, um, but it includes basic diagnostics, a lot of wound care, um, especially considering people are often like on their feet or sleeping in rough conditions, um, as well as free medication, harm reduction services, meals, vaccinations, canes, walkers, glasses, hygiene kits, um, COVID tests, clothing, tent supplies, um, as well as assistance in trying to arrange social needs, like trying to arrange for transportation, emergency shelter, um, getting work with insurance um, or getting a PCP or working on temporary housing. Hi everyone, my name is Arthi and I'm involved with the Student Run Free Clinic. Our clinic is located about three miles away from campus. We are a fully functional nonprofit primary care clinic that provides completely free care to the uninsured people of Metro Detroit. A unique aspect about our clinic is that it is entirely run by medical students. So our students are responsible for scheduling patient appointments, taking medical histories, providing lab services like blood work and vaccinations and more. Um, we also provide a variety of education and resources to various programs for mental health, um, substance abuse and women's health. Um, so for me personally, why I joined, I'm very grateful for the hands-on real life experience working with patients. I knew going into medical school that I wanted patient experience early on, and SRFC has allowed me to foster meaningful ex relationships with the Detroit community and get that firsthand patient experience, especially with the opportunity to experience running a clinic on our own. Um, so with that, I will pass it on to Julia, our Board of Student Organizations President. Thank you so much, Arti. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Vila Santangela, also second year um, and the president of the Board of Student Organizations. So a little bit about BSO. Um, we are an entity that works in collaboration with a lot of other entities here um, at the School of Medicine. So we work with the Student Senate, uh, the Student Affairs Office, social media, the alumni offices, the Institute of Justice and Inclusion, as well as all the organizations that I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. Um, we really help with events as well as uh, transition of officers and things of that sort. So an event that we host every single year is the Student Organization Fair. There are truly so many organizations here at Wayne. There's, there's, and there's more coming every single year. Uh, students create more organizations. Um, and during this organization fair, you can really get to meet um, all the organizations and kind of see um, what you like. Next slide, please. Uh, another event that we do is the ethnic fair. Again, all of these events would not be able to happen without the student organization. So this is also put on by amaz our amazing student organizations, particularly the cultural groups. Uh, this event encompasses a lot of um, uh, performances, whether there are spoken words or dancing, um, as well as cultural food. And then something that Arts in Medicine and other student organization puts together is the lighting of the Masrick Bridge, which is a, a bridge that uh, conjoins the Masrick Building and the Scott Hall Building. And this lighting of this bridge is a holiday event that will be lit up for the rest of the hol holiday. Um, another event, this is more uh, the learning communities, um, which are uh, communities that you get put in as a first year and kind of uh, they're like your family here at Wayne that you live with for another four years, um, as in like, you know, they help you out uh, with school and anything of that sort. So the learning communities put on this orientation Olympics, um, which are games that you can play with your classmates and really get to know your classmates. Um, for example, tug of war, uh, three legged race and things of that sort. So it's truly an amazing event during orientation orientation. Finally, I'd like to touch a little bit about life in Detroit. Um, so if you, especially if you're coming from um, another state, um, there are many places you can live here in Detroit. You can live in, and they're, they're listed here, but uh, Midtown, New Center, Riverfront, Corktown, and Greektown are all uh, in Detroit. But there's also, especially if you have a transportation vehicle, uh, you can live in Royal Oak or Ferndale or Gross Points. There's also a lot of things to do in Detroit. Uh, there are a lot of sports teams as well as theaters, such as the Detroit Opera House. House is actually pretty famous. Um, and then Fox Theater, Majestic Theater, uh, a lot of different restaurants with a lot of different food, um, as well as outdoor activities. Um, 
that are available. And yeah, I just like to finish by saying that our student organizations are truly ama amazing. They really do so much and they just go above and beyond for a community, both at Wayne as well as uh, the Detroit community. Um, and said that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Rebecca Kish Huber. Thank you, Julia. So I'm Dr. Kish Hulbert. I am a quadruple Wayne alum, actually, and I'm the vice president for the Medical School Alumni Association. Um, and we really have one of the most involved and engaged medical alumni associations really across the country with more than 25,000 alums worldwide. Our alumni association sponsors and hosts a lot of programs for our students um, to interact with the alums while you're in school here. So some of those things you can see on the screen, they include things like medical specialty lunches and webinars where you can meet with um, physicians practicing in a variety of different specialties, um, talk to them about um, getting into residency, what the specialty is like, those types of things. Um, some of our physicians also host dinner with a doc, which is a little bit more of a um, smaller, more intimate gathering where you guys can go out to dinner and more of a casual way to get to know each other and learn more about different specialties and different careers in medicine. Um, we also have a huge network of alums who are willing to have students shadow. Um, and so um, you can look at our list, um, you know, look at different specialties and subspecialties that you might be interested in um, and find alums who are willing to let you come shadow them even before your clinical years so that you can get an idea about um, specialties that might be appealing to you. Um, we also have such a wide network of alums really across the world um, that our alums also help our students travel. So if you are going someplace for an away rotation, um, or for interviews, uh, if we ever get back to in-person interviews, then our alums will also help with that as well. Um, and then lastly, our alumni association also sponsors uh, the Future Docs event, which some of you may have attended as kids. Um, so it's a great opportunity for our kids to come in, um, learn about fields of medicine. They get to do some fun experiments and um, different kinds of things. And my kids have always enjoyed that a ton. So those are just a sample of some of the opportunities that you have to engage with the alumni. Um, our alumni also provide funding for the student orgs that Julia just talked about. Um, and you'll have lots of opportunity to be involved in those. We also support milestones like white coat ceremony, match day, uh, commencement, things like that. Um, and really as alums, we're here to be, for, to be here for you uh, from your M1 year through retirement. So with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Krishnan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clishard Pulpert. Um, so yes, uh, I am a proud alumnus of Wayne State University School of Medicine, and I'm so excited that you're all here to learn more about our school. Um, you know, I especially love the family culture that we have here. And what you see in front of you, um, you know, here is a profile of the class that we recently matriculated that joined the Warrior MD family back in July. Uh, in total, we matriculated about 300 physicians in training. Uh, with a somewhat equal proportion of males and females, you know, slightly uh, skewed to females. Um, we had over 30 first-generation college students. And in terms of state residency, our M1s hailed from over 25 home states, uh, with just over 60% of the class identifying as in-state students and about 36% identifying as out-of-state students. Now, also over here on the right, uh, you can see the distribution of our students across the major states that our students apply from. So, for example, you can see here uh, Michigan being the largest at 192, uh, next being California at about 144. Um, and then we also have subsequently Ohio, Florida, Illinois, and Massachusetts as well. Next slide, please. So next, so after your application is submitted, how do we evaluate your application? So here I will discuss uh, our application evaluation process and how we do so holistically. So going left to right, we kind of begin with your primary and secondary application. And so our holistic review, for example, I would say let's kind of like, as the image shows, begin with a secondary application. So we look at that to kind of assess whether or not you really meet our mission statement. We then move into your personal statement where we get to gauge uh, why you want to actually be a physician and who are you? What is your road to, and your journey to coming into medicine? We also look at your academics like your MCAT and GPA. We also look at letters of recommendation and begin to assess how others that uh, either taught you or that you came in close contact with with some of your clinical exposures can speak to you in terms of your attributes on being um, a really great medical student. 
We also look at uh, other criteria such as distance traveled uh, in, in terms of how you've overcome hardships or challenges or obstacles. We also look at community service activities to identify uh, very meaningful experiences that you've had in your journey uh, and how you've created a habit of taking care of other people. And then finally, also looking at healthcare experiences. Uh, so to understand uh, your degree of compassion um, and do you really have a thirst of wanting more? Um, then we also bring you over to like our interview process that kind of encompasses a faculty alumni interview, a medical student interview and five MMI stations. So as you can tell, uh, each component is an equivalent component in your holistic evaluation. Now here we bring you to some very important dates to remember as you approach the application process. And starting to the right, um, your, your primary application um, will continue to accept them all the way through December 31st, so the end of this year. So it's not too late to submit your primary application and or even your secondary application if you have yet to submit it. Next, moving over to the left uh, part of this, the slide here, from August to February, we conduct approximately 1,500 interviews. Ergo, we will still be sending out interview invites all the way through January of 2023. So per AAMC traffic rules, uh, we are only able to give out offers starting in the beginning of October. Um, and they'll continue on a rolling basis um, until the um, beginning of our class uh, that starts in July. And in total, we give about 600 to about 700 offers. Next, uh, another important date to kind of watch out for, um, important month, I should say, is our second look day, uh, which occurs in April of the following year as well. Um, and it's a time in which students with multiple acceptances get invited back to the medical school uh, to kind of give you a better um, understanding of really what are the services, support, and resources that we can provide to you here at Wayne State University. And then finally, in July, we, be we begin class. So uh, with that said, we can move to the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to transfer it over to Dr. Barbara Jones and Adam Zangerly. We'll discuss the financial aid application process here at Wayne State. Hey, thank you, Dr. Christian. Uh, my name is Adam Zangerly. Uh, I'm along here with Barbara Jones. We are financial aid officers at the School of Medicine. Um, we are the two financial aid people dedicated to the School of Medicine class. And we work with the main financial aid office at, uh, on campus with the total staff of about 35 to 40 uh, people. Um, briefly, the financial aid process that you see up on the screen now um, for potential students, you wanna apply for the FAFSA, which you can do now all the way through all of next year. Um, once you apply for it, you make sure that you have Wayne State listed as your school of choice and complete the 23-24 FAFSA. In the next few months, we will get those processed. And for the students that are admitted, we will make award letters available in starting in March, April of 2023. Um, one other thing that students is a good to look into now is if you've had financial aid in the past, either student loans or other aid, um, you can view your aid history at studentaid.gov if there's anything that you need to get corrected or updated. Now's a good time to look at that. Uh, I know for the last couple of years that um, student loan payments and interest have been suspended. So most people have, who have had student loans and graduated in the past kind of put those on the back burner. Now's a good time to take a look at that. Starting in January, student loans, previously issued student loans are gonna go into repayment for students that have already graduated or not enrolled. Um, so you wanna take a look at that. The next slide up is a brief um, explanation of how we award need-based grants. Um, we offer students who are eligible um, based on our criteria up between $2,000 and $18,000 per year um, in grants. Not, these are, this is money that you do not have to repay. Um, and it is renewable for four years based on your satisfactory academic progress. More information on that is available on our website and um, these will show up on your award letters when they are issued. The university does have additional academic scholarships that are not issued by the financial aid office. Um, more information on those will be made available to you um, through the admissions process. Um, like I said, initially, there's two people, myself and Dr. Jones, that are dedicated here. We're on, um, on campus at the med school. 
Um, we can be contacted by phone, email. We do do appointments, uh, virtual or, or in person. Um, so if you have questions about the process going forward, please contact us. We'll answer any questions you have, try to make the process as easy as possible. And, um, and that's about it. So with the next person coming up is gonna be Laura Samuelson from Enrollment Management with additional information for you. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, so happy to have you all here. Um, like Adam said, my name is Laura Samuelson and I work in enrollment management and under records and registration at the School of Medicine. Um, one of the things that you guys will experience once you are onboarding to Wayne State University um, is our financial literacy and debt management program. Um, I oversee that program and we are working to help you guys kind of manage your expectations, learn different tools and resources um, to really understand managing the debt that you will accrue while you attend medical school. Um, we have some wonderful comprehensive resources built out for you guys. Um, we will be utilizing AAMC's uh, financial wellness, financial literacy tools um, for medical school and beyond. Um, we also have iGrad through financial aid, um, and we will have a customized Canvas course for students to um, go through different modules as it pertains to financial literacy. So you'll have many emails coming from me. Um, we'll go over one-on-one -on -one meetings with the enrollment team for students that need more individualized help, how to budget your refund, um, understanding SAP, education, educational modules for financial wellness, as I mentioned, AAMC. And most of all, we're here for you. So anything that you might need, if you have any questions about anything at all, enrollment management is uh, ready and willing to help you. So I have my email address and our website, um, but feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And with that, I will pass it back to Don Yargo, Dr. Sprague, Dr. Steffes, and Dr. Walker um, to wrap up our event. Unmute, we've gotten kind of used to that. So first of all, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. We did have a couple of overarching questions. There are still a lot of questions in the chat. I promise you that we will be getting answers to those if we don't do it in this session and we'll send it out to you when we send out the link to this um, event. So I have some questions for some of our esteemed guests. So um, Dr. Sprague, um, we know that you've already invited over 800 applicants to interview. Are there still more interview spots available? Uh, yes, as Dr. Uh, Abhi Krishnan had spoken earlier, um, we will interview around 1500 applicants. So there's still uh, five, 600 openings for invites. And uh, a few years back, we used to interview around 800. And I know when I applied to school, the most important thing to get is you have to have an interview. So everybody would look at their website. If you think you'd be a good fit for Wayne or have any questions, certainly contact us because we still have a lot of openings. Dr. Steffes, COVID had a major impact on life and on education. What does the new normal look like for medical students in hospitals and clinics? Time do I have? <laughs> Another uh, hour? We'll, we'll give you like three minutes. Okay. I could spend an hour on, on this. Um, when, when the hospitals locked down when COVID started um, and the hospitals didn't have enough uh, PPE for students, et cetera, et cetera, the students for a couple of weeks couldn't do their clerkships, but we found them out there in the tents testing the public, doing drive-through testing. They were running errands for doctors who had to continue to take care of the patients. They were doing things to contribute to everything. It was our proudest moment. It was really something to see the students who weren't gonna sit home during the pandemic, they were gonna help take care of the patients. Um, that is the spirit at Wayne and that has continued on now. Um, we do, um, have um, students taking care of COVID patients, but more importantly, we have second and third year residents now who were part of that first pandemic who are now taking care of the patients in, in, uh, for real uh, as physicians. So 
we were glad that we moved through there. We made a lot of very creative solutions to continue medical school. We were one of the first schools to get our students back in clinical rotations and being part of taking care of the uh, pandemic. And like I said, it was a very proud moment for our school. As the years go on, we will, um, there's been a lot of changes in how um, in the patient physician relationship as part of this, we are still catching up on uh, other medical care that is taken care of or didn't, that got uh, delayed during um, the lockdown and the pandemic. So a, a lot of changes um, and um, it, you're right, Don, that it's a new normal. Um, we're not going back to the way we did it before, but we've, uh, we've learned a lot of things, including how to um, run classes and meetings on Zoom. And I'll just follow up and say that the picture that was shown in the gross anatomy labs where the students were masked with uh, face shields, that was during the pandemic. We never shut down. We kept gross anatomy rolling throughout the, the pandemic. And so we were one of the few uh, medical schools in the country that just kept open. We're very Thank proud you of very that. much. Um, Dr. Sprague, we heard a lot of information today. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed. Um, and, and we have a lot more to share and we really enjoy sharing it. Can you summarize what makes Wayne State University School of Medicine unique from your perspective? Well, in the last two hours, all of these points were touched on, but I will uh, summarize what makes Wayne unique. Hands-on clinical experience from day one, extensive community engagement, including 80 student, 80 student run activities, a collaborative environment for students, faculty, and alumni, and our many research uh, opportunities in our scholarly concentrations. So basically, we are um, educating physician leaders that contributes to our uniqueness. Thank you. Dr. Walker, um, this is a question that I get frequently from prospective applicants. So we're still using full cadaver dissection. Why do you believe those, that's an advantage to continue to um, that educational experience? Uh, many reasons. Um, it allows you to um, see, feel, uh, smell. All your senses are are um, being activated with the gross anatomy experience. And, and I say experience because it is. There's none other like it. The students that that come here, they all want to be here um, and, and have that experience. And this is the jewel of our program. Uh, we have one of the largest cadaver programs in the country. Um, there's not many places that have 50 cadavers uh, that students can see variations for, and you won't see that in places that are using electronic um, methods to uh, teach anatomy. Uh, there's so much to learn. And the teamwork and the professionalism that is developed in the gross anatomy labs, I mean, this is where you start forming your uh, physicianship. And so um, it's, a, it's a great team building experience, none, none like it anywhere. So we encourage you to, uh, to grab it. Dr. Sprague, what qualities, we heard about how to fill out your personal statement and what we're looking for. What are the qualities the admissions committee is looking for in applicants? Okay, we're looking for individuals who are highly ethical, integrity, empathy and compassion, and at the end of the day, are these individuals who we'd want as colleagues and individuals who will be treating family? All right, those were all the questions that I had for this panel, and we are um, a little early, yay. Thank you to all our presenters for that. Uh, I'm gonna let Dr. Steffies have another minute and Dr. Walker to have another minute. What do you wanna share with our prospective students. Well, just real quick, and not only do we have gross anatomy as a, an active experience, but we have many other active learning uh, strategies that we use. And um, yes, we do have lectures that we provide information to the students, but we um, practice everything that you encounter in lecture with with some type of exciting active learning. And this is, this is the way in which you are able to build your foundation. 
Um, so don't don't expect to come to Wayne State and, and sit in your apartment or come to a lecture hall and just get passive information. We're going to get you to get your hands in there. Wayne students are well known for being doers. They're the ones that step forward. They never step back. And um, that's what we graduate uh, here at our medical school. So be ready. Dr. Stephan. And Dr. Walker, that continues on into clinical clerkships where you can always tell a Wayne student, um, you may not be able to describe them, but you can certainly recognize one when you see them. They are the doers, they step right in, they get their hands dirty and they know their patients well, they take care of their patients well, and they become uh, outstanding physicians in many fields. We're a big school, but we've got a lot of opportunities in um, every specialty. I don't think there's anything that we're lacking amongst all our hospitals. Um, whatever specialty you're interested, whatever practice from uh, tertiary care to primary care, we have those settings. Um, and you know, whenever we go out and need medical care, we're looking for a Wayne grad too. Thank you all very much. Um, I will encourage all of you to stay connected with us. Um, questions that you have that you didn't ask or that weren't answered, um, obviously, we're going to send out a transcript with the questions and the answers, um, even if it takes us a little while, um, but certainly email us at mdadmissions at wayne.edu. Um, our website is admissions.med.wayne.edu. You can find all sorts of um, information on student affairs, the scholarly concentrations and the curriculum as well. Um, at med.wayne.edu, um, go to students and you will find a lot of links for that, Facebook and Twitter, and we look forward to seeing you. We will get this posted, give us about three to four weeks because we have to get it transcribed, but it was a pleasure to meet all of you. We thank you for the time that you spent here and we hope that you found it very informative. <laughs>